Hi there, I'm Liz Eshi, and you're listening to There's an AI for That. Today we have with us our host, Dimitri Shapiro, and guest Justin Smith, CEO of Samcart. Samcart helps tens of thousands of creators to easily sell, boost conversions, and maximize customer value anywhere they interact with customers. Prior to leading the team at Samcart, Justin worked in seed stage startups and larger high growth SaaS companies. He's raised $100 million in capital and specialized in SaaS, e-com, B2B software, fintech, and generative AI. A lot, lot going on there. We are excited to have you on the podcast, Justin. This is a very intense and honestly confusing time for creators with the publicity and interest in generative AI, which we will definitely dig into. But I think Dimitri and I would like to start with your journey at Samcart, what drew you there, and then we can kind of get into how Samcart is supporting creators in this new world of AI generation. Awesome. Well, thanks. I appreciate the time. So I guess I maybe I'll start a little bit of a background of myself. I was born in the Washington, D.C. area, and like everyone else in the Washington, D.C. area, I thought I was going to go work for the federal government. So after college, that's where I first landed. It was definitely not the place for an entrepreneur <laughs> at all. Since then, I left and worked at various tech companies. I started a few tech companies all around e-commerce, creators, and SaaS, all the way from very small couple-person companies all the way up to big public and trade companies. That's where I actually met the co-founders of Samcart back in the day. They also were from the Washington, D.C. area. They, Brian and Scott, were making a transition from, they were creators themselves, and they were selling, they were, I forget the name for the term, they were big baseball players in college, and or all American. They're all American baseball players in college. <laughs> I, I'm clearly not a baseball person. You won't tell them you got sports, that. <laughs> yeah, so they're all American baseball players in college who took that information and created content around help, helping coaches and, and parents with high school and college baseball tips and tricks. And so what was interesting about the sort of founding story of Sam Card is that Sam Card actually started there where these two founders were selling these baseball products. They kind of hit a road in, back in 2014 where they were unable to sort of, they were hobbling, hodgepodging all these different solutions together to try to create this e-commerce platform. There was no sort of Shopify for them at the time. And they really hit a brick wall. And so they sort of partnered with myself and a couple others to sort of figure out how to outsource and build an internal tool that was eventually became Samcart. And what the funny story is, is that pretty soon, shortly after it launched, so they had this internal tool that they were using in 2014, 2015, Pretty soon, people cared less about what they were selling, more about how they were selling it. People in the in the industry were like, yeah, yeah, baseball products, whatever, but what is this software you're using and how do I get access to that software? And that was sort of their big aha moment, which was sort of like, yes, like we should productize this. And that's where I came in with my background in SaaS. I, I partnered with them on helping them to make that transition. I stayed connected with them. I, I distinctly remember the, the story. It was a Thursday. I came home to my wife. I said, Hey, I've got these two great job offers with these big brand name tech companies, big dollars behind, you know, big dollar job. And I, and that night I get a call from Brian after I told him kind of what was, what was going on. He said, no, no, don't, don't take those jobs. Come out tomorrow and come check out Sam Cart. And so I was in Texas at the time. So I flew out the next day. It was a Friday. I flew out. I'll never forget. I got there, flew in for the day. And I, and I was just I, I think I was sold within the first five minutes that I needed to join Sam Card. It was, it sounds negative, but it was a company that was almost succeeding despite itself. And what I mean by that is like a bunch of low ego, amazing A player talent, a tremendous marketers, really solving a pain point in the market, but they had no technical co-founder. There was no sort of operational or business process. And so I said, look, this is an area I can really make an impact. And so that's when I joined the team and it's been a, uh, a wild ride that was back in 2017. So it's been an exciting ride. I think I joined when it was two or three million in revenue and you know, we're doing tens of millions of, of revenue now in, in such a short period of time. So it's, it's been a pretty, pretty exciting ride. Yeah. I guess I can talk a little about what Sam Card is and, and also about a, a recent acquisition we made, which I think is going to be really exciting to your audience. So Sam Card is a digital seller e-commerce platform. And so digital sellers sell slightly different than your traditional e-tellers. They're not looking for someone to come around your, to their store and shop around. They're typically having their products being discovered offline, so they're off their property. So whether that's through Instagram or social or ads or email or community or influencers, 
And so they really want buyers. They want a very fast conversion. The minute a product is discovered, the ability to unlock that, that, that customer as, as fast as humanly possible. Also, they probably have a whole bunch of different product types. So they might be selling digital goods and physical goods and memberships and subscriptions and even podcasts like the one we're on now. And so they need their e-commerce platform to be able to handle all of those things in the same ecosystem. And that's, that's what essentially SamCart does. One thing that I think will be really interesting to this audience is SamCart, just like Shopify and many others, you know, e-commerce platform, the biggest challenge that we have is for a customer to be successful is creating a product. So do they have a product? The two biggest drivers for success is do you have a product or do you have an audience, right? You can have one or the other and find the opposite one, but you can't have neither a product nor an audience and be successful. Right. So we actually recently purchased a company called DropDeck. DropDeck was from two amazing founders based in the UK. What DropDeck is, is, is actually an intelligence, a generative intelligence engine that takes text and generates beautiful and engaging visual content. So think courses, eBooks, presentations, white papers. And, you know, we've, we've only been live for maybe about four months now, but I think we've generated a lot of interesting data points from that, that sort of side of the house. And that's where my passion for generative AI is starting to sort of really you know, increase by just watching how that company is really helping creators get to a point of selling faster. And I think it's been a super compelling and interesting journey. And In yeah, that's super, super interesting. Can, can you give us an example of like to generate a course, like, can you sort of expand on that a bit? Yeah. So actually what I could probably do is just talk you through a, a, a case study that we went through. So what we did is we took about 1500 people and so they're all from the same channel, all the same marketing source. And we took about half of them and we did nothing with them. We just sort of watched to see what would happen. And these were 1,500 people that were, they were creators that were coming on board to start to, to sell something, you know, whatever that might be. The other half we actually put through, we actually gave them tons of content around how to leverage AI to be more, be more successful creator. So the first step of that journey was, okay, let's, let's take your courses example for a second. So let's say they're a course creator. The first step was, okay, you need to create your course content. So how are you going to do that? We're going to leverage tools like ChatGTP or Jasper or some of the other commercial commercialized solutions out there. And we're going to create a five to 10 page Google doc of all the knowledge that you have around this topic. That's step one. Then step two is we're going to take that Google doc and we're going to put it into drop deck, literally just copy and paste it in a drop deck. And what drop deck does is it takes that, that written content. And I probably am going to butcher this. I'm sure the founders will do a much better job explaining the underlying core technology, but essentially it goes through three steps. It identifies what types of content you put in there, right? This is paragraph and bullets, and this is all the same type of content, and then figures out how that content should be sort of laid out within the course of, let's say, a, a PowerPoint or a course or a, or a white paper. Then the second step is it takes that content and it says, okay, what do I have within the confines of the boundaries that I'm supposed to work with? And so I have a slide or I have an a Instagram ad or I have a, a, a white paper or whatever it is. And so... I can use this content or I can't use this content. I have to resummarize this content, et cetera. And then the third step is actually taking that, you know, now it knows kind of what it, what it has available to it and then it makes it pretty or beautiful, a, a beautiful sort of compelling design. So a course creator, for example, what, that went through that process would leverage a third-party tool to sort of generate their content. They would then take that content and be able to have, let's say, a 20, 30 page or 20, 30 slide deck that they might then narrate on top of or you know, present throughout their course. Um, and what was the most interesting thing that came out of that was we saw that that first cohort that we did nothing with, about 3% of them went on to make a sale. The cohort that we did, that we put through this sort of more rigorous process around AI, we saw 15% go on to make a sale, which is astronomically, if you know that the average sort of person off the street coming in to try to get sales well under 3%. So seeing that that audience convert at such high, high rates was, was really shocking and exciting to us. Yeah. D and, Dimitri's and, definitely familiar with those numbers, having, you know, Len Koji. Yeah. yeah. This is super interesting. And, and so again, just to clarify, so your product does not help to generate the content, but takes the content that's been somehow compiled or generated and then formats it intelligently into 
any kinds of things, decks or other sort of materials that could be leveraged in a course or for countless other purposes. Yeah, in fact, right. DropTech right now is seeing actually tons of enterprise engagement agencies and folks that are using it beyond sort of our intended or not intended, but our initial use case around ebooks and, and course content for our creators. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is not that this is bad. There's nothing wrong with this. So we are living in a time where there's a bunch of companies that are being form formulated around the core of just leveraging ChatGPT or OpenAI's technologies, just sort of putting a wrapper or a layer on top of that. And I think what's really, what was really compelling to us about DropTech was they've spent years building their own intellectual property. It doesn't rely on any of that to be able to do that, those generative pieces that we've said, we just talked about. Now, there actually is an open, AI, open uh, chat GTP integration into DropTech. So there are parts of it that could be in the, in the, in the beginning, if you don't want to sort of pace in your information or you want to make a title more snappy or you want, you are building a whole ebook and you just really want that one title you for, don't have a, a good answer for and you want to sort of generate it. There's plugins to make those happen with the existing technologies. The most of the value that's been derived from DropX today is not from sort of generating text or images. It's generating the full visual content. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I'm I'm curious hmm, how all of this gets changed as sort of the the ability for all of us to create content goes exponential. And so we'll be able to create you know, obviously dramatically more content with less work and many more of us being able to do it where in the past I needed to use Photoshop, you know, later I got Canva or I needed to be able to write some copy or I needed to be able to record a video or to edit the video to create a thumbnail. Like all of this was like work that I had to do. It's kind of the world we live in now, but more and more tools like drop deck or, you know, many other tools that, that focus on, on other parts of the workflow, you know, seem to be sort of pointing to the fact that, that soon we're going to have orders of magnitude, more content, mm -hmm. but yet humans can only digest so much, uh, whether it's an enterprise or not. Meaning if all of your competitors are using the same type of tools have access to them, then sort of differentiation becomes extraordinarily difficult. I wonder if you have any thoughts on like those kinds of dynamics. Yeah, it's funny. Somebody asked me the other day, what is the most, what am I afraid of the most when it comes to AI? And this was sort of my answer. Put, put aside political or societal concerns around just massive content, which we are dealing with today, but put all, putting all of that aside for me, I think there's a great comparison with like SEO and blogging. If you're familiar with the blogging world and the SEO world, I mean, it is just so saturated right now. There's so many people out there blogging. There's so much content. You know, Google is having to change out their algorithms just to be able to help like understand where the real authoritative content is, right? And imagine that now times a hundred because it's mm -hmm. not just it's no longer the written word in the blog, but to your point, it's you know vi videos and visual content. In fact, I can't say too much about this, but I saw a sneak peek of of a company the other day, well-known company. There's already starting to sell this to some of the biggest brands in the world. And they showed me a video and it was an influencer, very sort of typical influencer in a kitchen, showing off a product, talking through some pot or pan or whatever it was. And at, at the end of the video, I said, oh, that's interesting. It looks like a video you threw on TikTok or whatever. And they said it was completely generative. There's no, that human didn't exist. And, and it was one of the first times, because, you know, I kind of, you can kind of t tell a little bit when you're looking specifically at generative video or you know, you're seeing like someone spoof the president with their mouth moving or whatever. You kind of you kind of can tell a little bit. This was the first time where I saw it at full production value, could not tell it was not a human being, c completely convinced that was a, a person. And I and it really was sort of shocking. Now, what I think this is going to lead to is actually not the creator economy, but the curator economy. If you think about I think the creator is actually going to need to be, is going to be, play a more important role in the future as more and more content is being generated. You're really going to be looking for more authentic sources or, or curators of these products and this content to be able to help distinguish between what all this information and products that are floating out there. So, you know, you might have someone that is a well-known known influencer around fishing or, you know, boating or makeup or whatever it might be. 
and you build an even stronger authentic connection with that creator. And they're then able to sort of continue to sort of filter and curate these products down. And we're seeing, obviously, we're seeing that today. I mean, that's the definition of what influencers are doing, right? But I think that's going to become even more critical when I could just ask a bot or I could ask ChatGTP, like, what are the 10 things I need to take camping with me? And they just sort of spit out 10, you know, things that all, you know, that are sort of aggregated and sort of more specific to sort of whatever content it's been pulling from. And that becomes an echo chain or in a feedback loop, it becomes even more important for these creators to not only curate this information, but then their own curated knowledge and curated data becomes its own sort of feeding into its own model, which then that becomes sort of, you know, built on top of itself. And that, that's essentially what UI, UI AI is, is, is essentially doing, right? This is starting to build these sort of customized and personalized models, not the right word, but sort of like layers that could be fed into these models that are able to then, you know, help cut through some of that generic content overload problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering why things need to stop in a sense at, in, in, that, in that chain of content that is now being generated. Now we have these curators that are looking at all of this noise and pulling out the signal. But why do we need human curators doing that when AIs can certainly be trained even if it's on that first generation of human curators to be able to figure out like what, what is curation in this case and sort of automate all of that. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I think I'm, that's a, that's a super compelling, I think, idea. I, I actually think it's going to be probably more of a, it's going to be cyclical, right? You're probably going to have a period of time where you know, right now, if you would argue that we're in the IQ phase of models mm -hmm. where they're very smart. They're, they're, everyone's training them to be accurate and maybe not personalized or sort of empathetic. And we start moving towards a world where there's, it's, you know, we're laying in EQ, we're laying in personalization, we're laying in accuracy, I think, or sort of personalized accuracy. I think we will shift to sort of that, you know, less, less focus on the creators and more focus on these models being able to deliver. But I promise just like everything that's successful, like vlogging, it will eventually, can, you know, that will, you know, mag when you start taking that to the 10th, you know, the 10th degree, you then start introducing humans again and the cycle will come back around to these creators that are sort of, you know, filtering mm -hmm. that data once again. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just, and then I'm sure we get smarter and it's just a race. I imagine that just keeps going. For sure. For sure. No, I, I, I agree. I just wonder how many humans, you know, with, with each one of these abstractions, you need fewer and fewer humans to be able to do it. And so, you know, today we've got hundreds of millions of social media creators out there that are producing content, trying to get an audience, engaged audience, et cetera. It seems difficult to imagine that we have more creators creating, and to your point, multiple orders of magnitude more content when consumers only have so much sort of time in the day to be able to consume the content. So I, I'm wondering if, if we're looking in a world where there are, there's a shrinkage of the number of creators that are trying to be professional creators, meaning creation is human nature. So everyone having the tools to express ourselves and be creative is, is, is wonderful. And, and I think just, again, human nature will continue to exist and only thrive. But like people who are looking at it as like a, a business, like I'm a professional content creator, a professional marketer on social media, but I'm wondering how these dynamics are gonna impact the supply and demand equilibrium basically yeah i i think that's a good point i think maybe what they create changes to your point about what, what is the definition of a creator right it's so ambiguous like are we going to see a human being sitting there and, and creating video content with their phone manually probably not right that's that that's as technology evolves right but what what is the role of the creator and what do they you know what do they do i think will shift and i and i actually it's interesting you bring that up because i there, I think there's this being sort of an eighties and nineties kid, I think we've who has watched Terminator maybe too many times. I think there's a sort of false assumption that AI is going to be sort of a human replacement. And I actually don't think that I think AI is going to be a human scaler. And so I don't actually my personal belief is I don't think we're going to see a whole obviously it will replace jobs for sure, but I don't think we're going to see a world in which like there are no, there's no need for a creator. It's what I what I think is 
interesting is there's actually an NPR article out for those who are interested in this topic. It's by it's a David Ator, um, or Ator, I probably um, said his name wrong. He's from MIT. He's a world-renowned sort of economist. And he, there's an interesting article about how he's talking about how he believes AI could rebuild the middle class. And sort of the analogy he gave was that over the last, you know, two or three decades, we've actually seen the technology like the computer and the internet actually erode the middle class with sort of benefiting the college educated and the higher end type of roles in the economy. And what's it, what's interesting, which, which is ironic because we now live in a world where people are not afraid of computers, but they're afraid of AI. And what's interesting is he actually tells a really compelling analogy about the industrial revolution. And so when you, when you said that to me, I sort of thought back to this article because if you think about the Industrial Revolution, before the Industrial Revolution, it actually looked very similar. The economy looked very similar to what it does now. You had a number of high-skilled artisans that were the highly sought after, highly paid, and then you had sort of like mass workers and an eroded middle class. And because of the Industrial Revolution, you saw then the sort of lower-skilled jobs be able to start through the assembly line process and through other technologies, be able to start doing more or taking a larger part in the manufacturing process which ultimately gave non-college educated folks higher wages and, and built essentially a very strong middle class. I think something very similar will happen with the, with, from an AI and, and specifically from a creative perspective. And what I mean by that, going back to your original point, I'm not trying to take us too far off, off in a direction, but you know, I think that changes then what a, who is a creator, right? Is a creator that really talented order that can, you know, build great videos or is a creator now sort of an expert? Like, is that, you know, we, we've all watched a YouTube video from like the fisherman that like it clearly, you know, is not meant to be on YouTube, but knows is very knowledgeable about like fishing. That type of person, I think in this new AI world could be the next Mr. Beast. I really do believe that. And so I think that there's just, I think there will be a little bit of a leveling, like a level playing around around valuing knowledge and authority of knowledge and understanding that information. And then also just sort of shifting of what that creator, what their day-to-day -day becomes. Mm-hmm. So certainly the industrial revolution is, is an interesting analogy here, but what I propose that we've never seen before in sort of any technological leap that we've had as, as humanity is we, we've never had something that we believe could make decisions. And so we, we could get less and less skilled people to be able to make decisions about fewer things on a factory line. You specialize in this, as long as you do that, you're a cog in the machine and, you know, that's middle class at the time. And so you can sort of make a living doing this part and, uh, you know, you could make a living doing this more important part. And so like some, uh, there was some scale there, but now that we've got machines that can make decisions that can think and that tend to be able to learn anything that any fisherman knows why would the fisherman create content? And then again, in a world where there's just orders of magnitude more content, even if a fisherman is creating content, like th doesn't everybody get diluted? Yeah, and I, mean, I, and I agree, by I, the way, on your point I don't think we're there yet, though. I think like, I think there's a, a good debate around whether these large language models are really thinking or whether they really do know what the fishermen know, because you know, yes, I think compute power has has scaled to the point where we're able to unlock some spectrum of sort of thinking or sort of decision making you know, framework or whatever you want to call it. I, you know, yes, I think if we're at a if we it, it's it's tough it's it's tough to un, to to believe that something will know. For me, it, I guess to take a step back, there's two types of folks, I think, who are passionate about the AI space. There's the folks that sort of lean maybe more towards the science. And then I think there's folks that lean more towards the business and application. And so for me, like my passion lies on a personal level on the business and the application. So I think if you're going through a thought exercise of where the science is headed over the next, you know, I don't know, I don't even want to say, I, I, a time frame because it's it's happening so quickly. It could be you know next year for all we know. 
but it's 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 an interesting sort of thought exercise. I think from from my perspective in the world of sort of like business and, and application, it's I still believe that we're you know, some ways off from a world in which the the non sort of surface level knowledge of any given topic could be easily surfaced by AI. Just my opinion. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> maybe we could double click on that and expand that. Like, um, maybe. Do you have like an example that, meaning you, you could go online now and you can see physicians, for example, talking about, you know, using chat GPT and sort of measuring themselves on being able to diagnose a condition and create a treatment plan. It's not perfect, but it's certainly extraordinarily impressive. Why? Because, you know, medicine is well documented online. Lots of things have been written about it. And so these models have been able to learn to mimic, if you will, a, a physician. But I agree with you. I think it's common knowledge that, that these things aren't thinking. Uh, large language models are these statistical models that predict the next probability of the next word, basically, right? But we are finding that not surprisingly, again, now sort of hindsight, I think is 2020, that if you look at it, that, that th there's a lot of work that's been done by humans to create the content that these models are trained on and sort of embedded in that content as logic and knowledge and all of those things. And therefore, when the models simply statistically mimic that, they are seem to feel like as if they're thinking or, if, you know, reasoning or are creative or any of that, but that still works. I guess maybe my, another way of putting it, uh, again, if we're talking about like producing content, there's, there's producers and there's consumers, creators and consumers. I believe that consumers to, even today really can't tell the difference between stuff that's been written by an AI or things that were written by a human. The average consumer in the average interaction can't tell the difference. This part is only going to go, you know, exponential in its capability to create compelling content, whether it's text or images or videos or any of that stuff and create it on the fly in seconds. And so what can a human do that beats this? Because this human, the consumer, is unable to discern the, the difference. Well, I think the medical example is a good one. I think there's probably, I just, I don't, I don't ever see a world, this is a personal thing, where it's sort of black and white, right? I think the medical example is a good one because there's probably places in the world where, not probably, there are places in the world that, have, that don't have access to medical care, right? So in those types of environments, would a completely AI-generated response be significantly better than the outcomes that they have today? Absolutely. There's also places around the world, including in the U.S., where AI can, be, can leverage, could, could, could significantly up-level the talent. Like, like we've talked about before, I mean, the, the example is... Uh, nurse practitioners is a perfect example that is a, it's a relatively new type of position, which is taking, you know, enabling sort of nursing, you know, senior nurses to go and get additional training and learnings and because they're able to layer that on, be able to take some of that load off of the doctors. I see a very similar parallel with AI. Ultimately, I just don't believe that just where we are today, right? This is just, I think we'll get there eventually on some spectrum of time, but where we are today. That doesn't mean that like I'm going to go to a doctor and I'm going to, or I'm not going to go to a doctor anymore because, you know, I'm able to go to some sort of bot type solution that recommends things for me. But I do think that in, in sort of certain scenarios, those types of, of solutions total sense as a replacement because you know, there's no real alternative. I think those types of scenarios, it means that we're able to sort of up level and learn more from the existing professionals or kind of improve their efficiency at scale. And then at some at some point right down the line, we may be able to start replacing some of those pieces. But you know, ultimately, there's always new sub subsets of information that need to be to be generated. In my mind, the the, the most successful people in the future, whether it's the business and AI space, content creators, are the ones that are sort of generating unique thought, you generating unique content. You know, whether that's a researcher in the medical field that's doing a new research on a drug trial, or they're understanding how certain things are interacting, or you know, we're just we're always evolving our knowledge, and so. Those pieces, I think, are always going to be part of the puzzle in some capacity. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a curious time, <clears throat> time we're in that. I think it's super exciting. It's, it's definitely, I think, you know, I personally, I don't know if I'd compare them in size and scope, but I, I was never the crypto wasn't super exciting to me. I was never into the VR phase. I think, you know, a lot of those things never really got productized. There's definitely some interesting, uh, there's some very compelling use cases for blockchain. I think blockchain as a technology is, is an interesting, compelling one, but. I really, I, I think that too many people are, because we've gone through some hype, hype moments like this in the, in the near past, I think a lot of people are assuming AI maybe is fitting into that category. And I really, it's, it's crazy how different game changing it really is and how, yeah. I mean, we, if we thought the internet was the next, having, having lived before the internet and kind of knowing what that life was like, and then seeing the internet change the world, like, I think this is only going to be significantly larger and well significantly much more disruptive than even the internet was back in the 90s mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> i i agree i think the way i tend to look at it <clears throat> is there is knowledge and then there are humans who have some of this knowledge some of us are more technical others are more businessy others are more creative yada yada we're all different we sort of have access to all of this knowledge. We've chosen the parts of knowledge of the world that we're experts in. And, you know, we show up to the workforce or, or, or socially and say, I am an expert on, you know, these topics. And I speak with authority because I've spent more time than others engaging with these topics potentially. And sometimes I say, pay me for my knowledge because this is, you know, what I do professionally. But if all of that knowledge is then available to, again, these more and more powerful machines that we're building these models, well, I, uh, my gut says that the web as we know it is going away and that there is no need to create websites anymore, that websites are created for the lowest common denominator, for, for the persona, for the target audience, whatever you want to call it, of who you think will be visiting the website and you create the website for them. Websites used to be static. Now they're dynamic, but they're still dynamic, but, but sort of creating general content because most of the content is written by humans for some persona, for some group of people. Mm -hmm. But I, it seems that in the world that we're at now, like I think we're starting to see that now, certainly in the next couple of years, where you know content generation becomes faster and faster and these models can already sort of generate custom content for each one of us on the fly, on demand. And so when I show up to this website, I get radically different content than when you show up to the website and, and what you get. And that content is created not by any human, but created by the machine, by the model that says, you know, I need to teach this human that I'm engaging with, no matter who they are, I need to teach them about this product that my company is selling. And so I understand each human differently and specifically help them see my product through the right lens. And in that scenario, the, the, I think the number of, of humans that are impacted in a scenario like that seems to be profoundly large, like majority of white collar workers who are doing that. Like somebody still needs to produce automobiles, although we're automating that as well in, in factories, right? Robots. And, you know, before it seemed safe to be in sales because it's all about relationship. But again, it seems more and more as a society, we tend to be, again, hard to, to, to judge, but my gut says that that is, is weakening, that we optimize for convenience and cost. And so if we don't have to talk to a salesperson, that's amazing. If it's cheaper because we don't have to take, talk to a salesperson, that's amazing. In the past, we needed that salesperson to be able to explain this thing to us because the website didn't do a good enough job explaining it. Why? Because again, websites are made for the average person. Each person is unique. But if they can be made on the fly, and if, again, if these things can be conversational to figure things out, I think you're right. Meaning, I think I'm defining it in a different way, but I think you're right. That this is, you know, this is the new internet. Uh, the new internet doesn't have websites. The, the new internet has you engaging with knowledge, 
filtered by this personalization agent that is awesome at being able to understand all things that exist, awesome at being able to understand what you need and who you are and connect you and give you that kind of capability to do it. I, I wonder what you think of that. Yeah, I actually, I was, uh, I heard Sam Altman speak maybe three or four months ago. And the one, the one thing that I really took out of that speak was his sort of positioning on interfaces and how this is, this is going to change how we interface with information. And it's exactly what you're saying, which is that to your point, like what, what type, what do, do websites even exist for sure? I think what I keep going back to, and maybe this is just me spending my entire career with sort of creators and internet marketers and sort of digital sellers and influencers. And what, what's interesting to me is there seems to be, regardless of technology, this human nature, to your point about the, the, the fastest, easiest, quickest way possible, right? Whether it's the fastest way to learn something or the fastest way to make money online, or, you know, there's just this natural sort of inclination to this, you know, this notion. And what I find to be sort of interesting is when I look at some of our successful creators, you could make a very similar art, putting speed aside, because the, the new AI makes things incredibly fast, which might be the answer to this question. But what I find interesting is that a lot of these creators, they're not actually, they're just sort of compiling information together. They're, you know, many of the create there's certainly authorities and very specific niches that are like, I'm the best at this one specific topic. And they've been doing it for 15 years and they really know about boats and they know exactly how the engine works and that kind of thing. But there's definitely a lot of creators who are just aggregating content together. And it's the same content I could Google around if I spent, you know, two hours, I could watch some YouTube videos and get that information. And it's this, it's this interesting kind of what I'm sort of fascinated with is this human nature to want to sort of interject itself between the, the, the consumer and the producer. And it feels like, I, I don't actually know, I, I haven't given a total thought of like what this will look like, but I have no doubt in my mind that, that we will find a way to interject ourselves between those two endpoints. And so there will be someone who is, you know, building that customized data that gets added in, or there's someone who, you know, whether technically is correct or not is actually finding a way to sort of interject themselves and to sell something between those two endpoints and we see it you know today where i could google and i could you know before youtube and and, and short video clips and video content it was even harder you'd have to google around and read pages and pages or buy books and then videos made it easier and then the the, you know, the, the world adapted and so now we're basically you know living in that world and then it feels like this type of a pattern of behavior will adapt itself. I don't know what that could look like. I'm curious what your thoughts are and how, and if, it, it, how that might adapt in the future. So. Yeah, I think the, the information technology, innovation and in information technology, as Ray Kurzweil points out, obviously accelerates exponentially. And in sort of the first few steps of an exponential curve, there doesn't seem to be all that much acceleration until you get later and then you get extreme acceleration. It feels to me, and I, you know, I believe that anyone sort of thinking about this should be able to see the same, that we are already at a place where humans are the bottleneck in the relationship between human and information technology. Meaning there are countless apps I could be using right now that would make me faster, better, smarter, you know, more productive, happier, et cetera. The technology exists to make my life better. I don't have any room in my life to be able to embrace that technology, implement it, use it, et cetera. So I'm the bottleneck, not the, the capabilities available to me. And it's clear that those capabilities driven by the ability for AI to iterate infinitely faster than any human can. By the way, one of the reasons we got these mRNA vaccines is because of this ability of rapid iteration in such a short period of time for COVID. Th that's only accelerating. And so what are we humans to do in a world where we can't leverage all of the innovation that's available to us, at, at, which we're already there? And, and so it seems that the, the right approach potentially is, is to take, again, sort of the human a bit out of the equation in all of these middle parts and simply leave human and 
information technology and create sort of a new way for us to be able to engage with these new sophisticated, you know, types of, of information technology. All of this is based on, you know, these neural networks, right? As, as these things are called. And so neural networks, modern neural networks are great at being able to take data sets, a bunch of data about anything really, which you can throw at them and they crunch it and they tease out of its structure, you know, with, with, with weights and biases. And, and now once they sort of tease that out, they can allow human or other AIs or anything else to sort of engage and, and, and be able to, to process things with those, the weights that they've learned that. Now, it seems to me that the right approach to leveraging that is to, for us humans to be able to create a, a data set of ourselves, because we're all different in a sense, sort of, again, it's like digitize your mind and, and then present that data set on an ongoing basis to AI that can take it, process it, and understand this at all of these unique levels that each one of us, you know, is at. And by the way, we're obviously all constantly changing. And, and so it has to keep up with that. But if that's the case, then the AI will be able to take the lead and, and do amazing things for. So for example, you know, most of us don't know what our weaknesses are. We have a really hard time as humans sort of figuring out what our weaknesses are. Sometimes our friends and family know us better than we do often because they can see things that we can't see. You know, that's sort of one thing. Another thing is, you know, we obviously don't know what we don't know. And, and so we've been relying on these information technologies that respond to us, like Google, when we ask them a question, Google brings us back a response. But if I don't know what I don't know, how do I ask the question? I obviously can't craft a query. But in this new model, where if I am digitized on an ongoing basis, the AI does know what I don't know and, and can then fill it in for me, meaning proactively create content and, and, and filter the, the world around us and give me exactly what I need that I didn't even know I needed. Fill in all the gaps in knowledge. Get me to understand everything that I don't quite understand, but now I can. By the way, humans should certainly have the ability to say, yes, I'd like to learn that, or no, I'd like to stay ignorant <laughs> because ignorance is bliss. But like, I, I think that those become like the really interesting, like radically different approaches of dealing with information technology. Again, where we're not driving it, but it is there sort of nudging us. And then, and, and we get to choose, you know, what kind of nudges we like and what kind of nudges we don't like. like what do you want more of a, in your life? You want more interesting stuff? Great. I'll bring you more interesting stuff. You, you want to learn more to be a better human? Great. I can do that for you. You know, Dimitri, yeah, I, I know I, in this, this world you've, you've described in the past and, you know, followers of ours will definitely be familiar with the concept, but you've, you've talked about there still being a place for businesses in this world and their, their process of marketing and sales might look more like feeding the AI with the appropriate information they have and the AI will then, you know, take that and disseminate it for the best, best users, best fit, best customers. Do you see a world where creators are kind of also able to, to feed the AI in the, in the same way? I, I think the, 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 the world I see coming does not require humans to help AI create content, whatever the content is. The AI will certainly be able to write fiction and then produce fiction to take things that are nonfiction and, and you know, knowledge of the world and, and, and be able to present that to each human in only the stuff that they need, specifically in the way that they will understand it. So again, I think that is here now. It hasn't all been sort of instrumented in, in a nice way. It hasn't all been connected, but all the pieces are there already. And it's obviously only going to get better. How, how would AI, and I don't, I, I agree with you. I'm just curious. Like, in your mind, how does AI understand, evaluate like a local service or understand the quality of a product, how something feels and touches? I guess, like, 
without any humans inputting that type of information, like how does AI determine that with just the basis of the, 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 the information that it has to go to it? Uh, someone has to digitize all that information. So yes, I meaning a language model does not know anything about some new product that was just released and, and how it feels. So it's not going to be able to figure that out. Somebody's going to have to articulate that and then make that part of the corpus of knowledge of like how this thing feels. But again, I think those, but I, but I think that's the role of the creator. I think, mm -hmm. I think the point, I'm, the point I'm getting at is yes, you know, you have a corpus of information, like going back to your example before about sort of, you have this personal, I'm sorry, what'd you call it? Personal sort of. Like a, 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 a yeah, digital assistant, let's say that yes. your digital well, property. So, but you, you have this information about yourself and you, you know, nothing about like right, right now I'm, I'm, I, my kids are growing up and they're at the age where I want to start taking them camping more. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of like searching for camping stuff, right? Content. So this corporate, you know, this, this, by the way, I think one of the hurdles we have is that this information isn't centralized, right? You've got all of these different corpuses living within different companies that need to be somehow some way brought together. That's the challenge that we need to overcome before we get to a world where there's like sort of no need for the, the human input. But Assuming that challenges are coming and we have this personal information that knows that my gap in information in knowledge is around camping. I think like when it comes to, I think the role of the creator in the future is able to feed the corpus information that it couldn't possibly know. It's more subjective and maybe less or more objective, less subjective. So it's more like, Hey, I bought these two camping bags, like these two camping pillows, and this one is softer than this one. It just feels right. Or I love sleeping on my side. This pillows right now. Of course, the brands and the companies have fed information to the corpus that says, look, this is a camping pillow. It's, it's, it's meant to be super soft. It's meant to sleep on your side. But ultimately, until you sort of have someone that's evaluating that sort of, you know, that usage and then feeding it back in the corporate, it feels like there's that still need for someone to be evaluating it. <laughs> yeah. So I think humans believe humans. So social proof is a, is a thing and we value reviews on you know, e-commerce sites. So yeah, again, I, I, I think there'll be plenty of things for humans to do. What the skill level is that's required of them is used to be like you kept leveling up, leveling up. And, and you know, the, the more skilled you were, the more valued you were. Now, again, with AI, it seems like everything's turned around. That there's going to be plenty of room for people feeling things and typing into some interface. This feels soft and this feels harder. But, but that's not a very sort of sophisticated job. It just has to be done because the AI doesn't have a, an interface to the physical world, perhaps, for now. But all of the other things seem to be uh, on this road to automation. Where And, and again, I, I think it, it, there, I'm not sort of speaking about a dyst dystopian situation. It becomes a, a certain type of utopia where we all get, we all learn again, in, in this thing that I see, we all learn at a much faster rate because this thing is the ultimate tutor for us. It knows us well enough to be able to understand what we don't know and specifically teach it to us in the way that we would understand it, to connect the things that are missing in our model about how whatever an automobile engine works. I know a bunch of things, but there's still gaps in knowledge. Great. So I don't quite know how it works. But this thing knows what I don't know. And so it could say, okay, let's focus on this. This piece is missing. There's a carburetor right now is this. And, and now all of a sudden I say, oh, great. Now I understand how an automobile engine works. Just that process of humans being able to learn much faster because the machine can produce content for them on demand, I think changes everything. I think it radically impacts sales. It radically, you know, meaning the function of sales. It radically impacts marketing. Somebody even, even just an interface change, like you mentioned, the even something as minor as an interface change, which is probably in the very near future, is going to dramatically change everything you just described, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's no need for Google ads. I mean, our business runs off Google ads, our business runs off Facebook ads. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know about you, but I found myself using Google just maybe 20, 30% less now that chat GDP is around because I can just sort of ask it quick one-off questions. Totally. Yeah. And yeah. so all of a sudden, the inventory of those ad units are going down. So absolutely, even just the interface change, I think is going to be pretty, yeah. pretty game-changing. Exactly. Well, I don't know. I, I, 
definitely drives me. It's funny because you you listed off all these things in the beginning and I, of sort of what I talk about, you know, what sort of what I've learned throughout my career. And I would say two years ago, I didn't really know much about AI. AI didn't, you know, I've not, I, I told you, I put myself in sort of the business camp, not the, not the science camp. What's interesting that I, I've sort of, as I've gotten more involved in this in the last year or two is to understand this really. What we're not seeing isn't relatively game-changing. It's been around for a while. We just sort of productized it better. We provided better interfaces than anyone has ever had before. We have more access to it to embed it into the technologies that we're using today. And that to me is is super compelling and interesting and and kind of it's we're going to see a whole new breed of people moving forward that are sort of exposed to AI and thinking about AI that never would have before. I got you know like me, who's more on the business and, and product side than the sort of science side of it. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for, for spending time with us. Thank you. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. This was, this was really interesting. And definitely, since we're, we're nearing the end of our time, if there's a, obviously, it, I believe people can go to your, your website if they're curious about what Sam Cart is working on. Is there anywhere else where you kind of showcase the, the work with AI that you're doing? Yeah, I think checking out dropdeck.com and cncart.com are sort of interesting areas to go. Yeah, I, I, I always, you know, I know, I know as the guest, I'm never supposed to come with my own questions, but, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in what you guys are doing with UAI. I'd love to hear sort of, again, the, the science behind it as described in this podcast and sort of also on the website and the content I've seen makes total sense to me. I'm curious, like, how you see this being productized. You know, obviously you have a product today that a consumer can download and use, but sort of my personal belief is that, you know, to your point, the, the, as these types of technologies are integrated into the, the, just the common flow of a consumer's days, we're really going to see massive change. I'm curious, like how, you know, what is sort of next step with UAI when it comes to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think that well, one, you know, lots of things are changing and moving around. So like all predictions should be <laughs> extraordinarily suspect. But we believe that AI should follow a similar model as a sort of mobile apps follow. Meaning before mobile apps, we were all using a browser. And it was the belief that the browser was the app. And, you know, you, you did everything with the browser. It was the Swiss Army knife. And so you opened up to do your day's work. You opened up a browser and that's what you did. And then mobile apps changed that quite radically, sort of with the concept of there's an app for that, sort of the right tool for the right job. Instead of having sort of just one multi-tool, one Swiss Army knife, you've got different specific tools that are best of breed for doing things. And today we're sort of looking at AI as consumers as being like this one tool that does everything. Chat GPT can help you write, you know, a resignation letter, start a new company, create content be your therapist, you know, countless other things entertain you. That's amazing that you got this monolithic thing that can sort of do that. The interface to it is quite clunky, meaning you got to type words, mostly on mobile screens. That's not a, the, the optimal interface. I joke, it's sort of like DOS for those of us that remember the world before Windows. It's, like, it's funny you bring that up because I was, as we were talking earlier, I was like, you know, we're actually going back to, we're going from DOS to a graphical interface stack to DOS again now that we're... Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I actually don't believe that's the, the killer interface to it. I believe that there's an AI for that. And that we will be, we will have access from our mobile phones or anywhere else to push a button and then be able to instantly leverage an AI to get something done, to answer a question, to do whatever, entertain us. And if we want to do something else, we'll push another button. And that AI is going to be able to help us do that most effectively because that AI already has all the context about what it is supposed to do. This AI is the therapist. This AI is the, you know, clickbait content generator. And this AI, whatever, does something else. And that's really where UAI, you know, is, is playing now. Like we already have hundreds of, you know, AIs for that, whatever that is. And we imagine a world of, you know, millions, just like the app stores have millions of different apps doing different things. We imagine millions of custom AI interfaces. By the way, these AI interfaces are leveraging, you know, as backends, these, you know, models, chat GPT, three, three, five, four, Anthropic Claude one and two, 
and then countless others that we will implement because we believe that the consumer should not care or know anything yeah. about AI models. That is not their, <laughs> their job. They're, they don't care. About, they just want to get something done or get entertained or do whatever. And we should provide them super easy, made just for that interfaces to be able to do that, leveraging all the power of these other things. Cool. And so, we're, yeah, we're kind of sort of in the stack of AI, we sit above all of this innovation in all of these AI models. We just package them together to make it easier for consumers to be able to do that. And by the way, the other interesting thing is allow any you know, business person really to show up and say, uh, I have an idea. There should be an AI for that. Like there should be an AI for that. Great. You can build it now because you don't need developers anymore in this world. Like we have this developer environment uh, that doesn't require you to be technical. You literally write just English words, you know, as it's prompt engineering. You create a spec of what your AI does. You explain it in English and the AI simply does it. And so you can create new applications for whatever it is, for your team, for enterprises, for industries, for your family, for consumers, whatever, you can create new apps for them, new AI apps for them in a matter of just a few minutes. Right. Because, because the hard stuff doesn't need to be done anymore. That's my point. Right. And it, it is interesting after all of our, our conversation about curation, that is an aspect of what UAI is allowing, curation of of AI building and curation of knowledge so that you can have a very custom AI for those yeah. specific needs. Cool. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the time. This was fun. Yeah, it's so great to meet you. Thank yeah, you. let's yeah. let's keep in touch. Thanks everyone. And we'll update you when we have another episode available.